Hello and welcome. This is the third session of Discount a Cash Flow with Python series. In the last session, we talked about corporate finance, uh, how a business is looked at from inside. Today's session, I would like to walk you through the essence of intrinsic value, the difference between value and price. The intrinsic value, when that, that is talked about, is essentially the value of asset based on its fundamental. We talked about the real estate business, a real estate example, where if you want to buy a house, you can look at what the price of a house is relative to the other houses in the neighborhood. But how about the price relative to the value of the asset itself? That's where the price and value comes into discussion. For cash flow generating asset, the intrinsic value will be a function of the magnitude of expected cash flow on the asset over its lifetime and the uncertainty about receiving those cash flow. The discounted cash flow, the DCF, is the tool for estimating the intrinsic value, where the expected value of an asset is written as the present value of the expected cash flows on the asset, with either the cash flows or the discounted rate adjusted for, to reflect the risk. When you are looking at the real estate price relative to what other houses in the neighborhood are being sold for, you're not valuing, you're pricing. But when you're looking at the fundamentals, such as how much rent you can collect from the place, you're valuing the business. The value and price could be equal or could diverge from each other. Price could be higher than value, price could be lower than value. And value can change as well based on the characteristic of the fundamentals. If a business is start deteriorating, the value of course is start deteriorating and going down, but the price could still remain high or price could go way lower than it should. They call it markets overreacting, whether it's towards upside or downside. So when the price is higher than value, we call it it's overvalued. When for price is equal to the value, our estimate of value essentially, we say it's fairly valued. And when it's price is lower than the value, we say it is undervalued. Value is driven by fundamentals, as we said, but price is determined by supply and demand with the mood and momentum of the market, the behavioral factors at play in, the, in a sense. There could be a money manager, uh, institutional manager, where they hold a stake in a business and then for whatever reason, they need to rebalance their portfolio. They need to react. They could be getting out of the positions and getting into something else. So when they're getting out of such a position, they could push pressure on the price. It depend, again depends what are the people are on the other side to make that transaction with them or not. If there are not enough people over there and they have highest stake in the business, of course, they're going to push up, push down the price if they want to get out immediately. So it again goes back to the supply and demand, the behavioral factor. Let's say there's a bad news or there's a good news and then people start with they're getting on the behind a bandwagon or jumping off. And again, that could make the price to diverge from value. So when if you're an investor and you think something is underpriced or uh, undervalued, if you buy such an asset, then you just have to wait for market to correct its mistakes. So the price and value gap will close if you want to call it mistakes. Effectively, you want that gap to close and price reflect value, and then you can make money that way. In previous session, I mentioned about valuing the entire business or the free cash flow to the firm, maximizing the firm value. And we talked about where the cash flow to the firm belongs to shareholder and bondholder. And bondholder banks are first in line and if anything is left is for, for shareholders. The free cash flow to the firm reflects that concept. So think of your revenue, deduct your cost of sales, your raw material that you need to pay to provide those goods or services. Then you have to pay your employees, you have to pay for R&D and so on. Then, then you arrive at your operating income. And then after you pay your taxes, we call that after tax operating income. You have to also take into account your reinvestment and depreciation, changing working capital, and then you get to the free cash flow to the firm. That free cash flow to the firm is available to bondholder and shareholder. That free cash flow discount as weighted average of cost of capital, which takes equity and debt into account, gives you the value of operating assets. You add cash, you subtract debt, you have the equity value for the owners of the business. One thing I would like to mention in the cash in the discounted cash flow modeling, we have a terminal here. We have a closure when we will assume there is a stable growth rate in the operating income and it means the company is going to continue to exist forever. And that's contradicting with what I said earlier, because I said corporate life cycle are 
essentially take into account the death of the company when they cease to exist. But if you do your math right, if you want to really go and do a discounted cash flow for, let's say, 50 years going forward, taking the decline of the business into account when they cease to exist, you're going to see that numbers that you would get is not going to be dramatically different from valuing a company as a going concern, where we call it terminal year. That goes to the mechanic of how the math works out, but this I just wanted to put it out there. Any business is targeting to generate revenue. They go after a market. There's a need in the society and they're going to provide. In order to take care of that need, uh, they need to have people, human capital, um, equipment, and so on to provide that goods or services. The difference that they pocket is called income. Uh, we measure that by saying operating margins, essentially how much they prof, how much there was their operating income divided by total revenue means how much they had uh, operating margin. And in order to grow the business, growth is not a free gimmick. They need to reinvest back to the business. Again, going back to that grocery store, you are running a profitable business, hopefully, in that grocery store example. And let's say you are netting out a million dollar per month. If you open a second store, you can perhaps net out another million dollar per month and that will add up to two million. But you have to go back and reinvest in the business. And in that example, we have to go to the banks or bondholders or go to the equity hole, uh, public market or our rich friends or family. Hopefully we have some of those where we could raise the money from. The expected free cash flow to the firm, as we mentioned, is revenue times operating margin minus taxes minus reinvestment rate. When we discount them at the cost of capital, we call that risk adjusted discount rate because equity owners demand some return, bondholder demand another return. We weigh them accordingly, then we cap with our rate of uh, weighted average cost of capital, and then we discount those per future cash. We arrive at the value of the business today. Now, this fellow chart actually summarized what we discussed about revenue, free cash flow to the firm, reinvestments, and uh, present value of the firm. So think of this time series where you have the free cash flow to the firm in year one, year two, year three, year four, and so on, one of however long you're projecting it. And then we have a terminal year, that closure year. That's where your business is mature and it's going to grow at a constant rate. And that constant rate must be less than or equal to growth rate of the economy. The growth rate of the economy reflects real growth rate of the economy, like let's say GDP reflects the real growth rate of the economy and inflation. Mathematically speaking, if your growth rate is higher than the growth rate of the economy, implicitly you're saying your business is going to take over the economy. Your business is going to be larger than the economy that you're valuing. And not only that's ridiculous, it is impossible. That's a very sensitive input to a discounted cash flow model. And if people are not careful with that, if they don't understand how uh, this model is sensitive to that parameter, they're going to come up with funny valuations. The first thing you would want to go and see whether how valid that DCF is, looking at, at the R minus G rate, because R is the discount rate at the terminal rate, G is the growth rate that we just take into account for the uh, perpetual growth. And the way we calculate the free cash flow to the firm at maturity is the earnings at constant rate forever. It means earnings of, let's say, the one year prior to your terminal times one plus your G. And if your G is, again, larger than the economy, that uh, that gives you a funny valuation. So a discounted cash flow model, you need, you need to have revenue. You need to have your operating margin. You need to assess your reinvestment. You need to assess at what rate you will discount those key future cash flow into the present and you'll need a free free rate and you need a cost of equity and cost of debt that's pretty much it the risk free rate is the default free long term in the same currency that you're doing the valuation so if you're doing in usd you could refer to perhaps as a treasury uh 10 year t bond which is it must be long term and that it should reflect the real growth rate of the gdp and inflation as far as the cost of equity, we have relative risk measures. We call it beta, there are accounting beta, there are proxy models such as asset arbitrage pricing model or a multi-factor model. Eugene Fama and Ken French came up with a Fama factor model that um, Eugene won the Nobel Prize in 2013 for his contribution in finance. But if you look at the cost of equity 
uh, models, they all start with CAPM, capital asset pricing model, and then they build up the asset arbitrage pricing model. They start from CAPM and then they build up the multi-factor model. Again, it contains CAPM and then out other, other, other factors, the proxies as well. So the essence, the very beginning of everything starts with CAPM. Well, CAPM is a price market price return model. So essentially you look at the return on the underlying asset relative to the return on the market. But Dr. Domodron covers it pretty much very well during his valuation course in depth. And you can read other articles and research papers on this field and choose a model. However, at the end of the day, you need a cost of equity and you need something that is reasonable and making sense. Uh, not just because, oh, I want to use six person across the board for every company. I want to use 10 person across the board for every company. Every companies are not the same. The cash flow, the risk profile of every company is not the same. So that will misguide you towards uh, whatever value you would get. You may start finding risky businesses undervalued and you start finding low risk businesses overvalued because you're not adjusting accordingly about the, for the risk profile. Again, if you don't want to use CAPM, you can go to accounting models, whether you can look at the, let's say a standard deviation of the operating income and divide it by the standard deviation of operating income across the board on, on average across public companies and see, okay, this would be a relative measure of risk of the risk profile of the business that you're valuing. I'll leave that due diligence to you to determine what model works for you whether it's CAPM, APM, multi-factor proxy, or accounting methods, whatever. I use CAPM, the capital asset pricing model, because I believe it takes a model to beat a model. And all of them start from CAPM and build up. And with all respect, some of them are just making up craps going up. Set the, I set that aside, th see whatever works for you. The model that I have built, the DCF model that I have built, utilizes CAPM. It also adjusts for some of its shortcoming that uh, the way Dr. the Modron does for, which is for leverage and also using the law of large number towards your favor, where you won't look at just a bit of the underlying business you're looking at, you're looking across sector or across similar companies. So there is a way to actually correct for some of the shortcomings of the, of the CAPM that to come way, way, way closer uh, to your true cost of capital. The way to adjust for that beta, we call it unlevered beta, which let's say you run a regression, the pick a company, let's say for instance, a consulting firm, Cognizant, Infosys, Accenture, and many other are actually publicly traded. You can calculate the beta of all of these companies, look at the median and adjust the median based on the debt to equity ratio of those companies, you would get an unlevered beta. Unlevered beta is a beta that is adjusted for leverage. If your business is leveraged up, if your company is leveraged up, intuitively speaking, you should have a higher beta, which reflects a higher cost of equity. So looking at the across companies that are very similar, do the same thing, are providing the same goods and services to the society, adjust for the leverage, you come up with an unlevered beta. Then lever the unlevered beta based on the leverage in the business that you're valuing. Uh, Dr. Domodron again covers the calculation, how it, how the process and mechanic works out in this course. My code does the same. My code requires the unlevered beta and it takes the, uh, it goes through the same mechanics to leverage it up based on your debt and equity that you provide to the model. We'll get to those, but essentially in a nutshell, that's part of the relative risk measure that you need for the cost of equity. The, the cost of debt is much more straightforward. You can look at if your firm has an outstanding bond, what's the yield on that? Or you could look at Moody's or S&P if your firm is rated. Again, I don't care much about Moody's and S&P ratings. The rest is, is history. You can look at financial crisis, what happened back then. I do my own due diligence and I do my own rating. But again, that is something that works for me. You have to find out what works for you. But if, at the end of the day, you need a cost of debt for your company. And here's a slide that Dr. Demodron provides on the measuring relative risk. If you don't like CAPM, right, well, here are all, all the alternatives that you can explore. That wraps up today's session. In the next session, I will be walking you through the model. I believe we can learn valuation by doing as opposed to just reading books or theories. So I pick a company and we will be valuing it based on their story and what we will be maturizing into the futures. I hope you found this session and this series useful and I see you in the next video. Thank you very much for listening.